Hey folks, uh, hello and welcome everyone to our event today. Uh, so my name is Dr. Shea Kiho and I'm a lecturer in Chinese studies here at the Contemporary China Center at the University of Westminster. And I'll be chairing the event today. So uh, our event today is the, the third in our uh, Contemporary China Center Conference Deconstructed series that we launched uh, this year. Uh, so you might have seen other events in this series included academia and China threat discourses and also the value of Chinese cultural studies. Uh, so both of these events uh, were recorded and are available um, on our YouTube channel. I've just posted the link into the chat. You can check that out. Um, and this event today is also being recorded. Um, our fourth event, uh, we'll also have a fourth event and that will take place on a very historically significant day of May 4th. And that will be connecting Chinese digital and analog spaces. Uh, so look out for details on that towards the end of uh, this event. So just a few words about the Contemporary China Center here at the University of Westminster before we kick off today's event. So we are a, um, a small virtual center uh, that, that focuses on interdisciplinary research on China, uh, where China is very broadly defined. Uh, our work is grounded in cultural studies, but we do also have members who are working outside this uh, disciplinary field. And so uh, I suspect uh, and hope that many of you have probably encountered uh, the Contemporary China Center um, on Twitter, for example. So we tweet at CCC blog UOW uh, and we tweet Chinese propaganda posters uh, from the University of Westminster's China Visual Arts Project. And you'll be hearing more about that later today. Uh, but for now, I'll just put the link into the chat to the China Visual Arts, um, uh, China Visual Arts Project. Um, and you've also hopefully encountered our blog, the Contemporary China blog, uh, Contemporary China Center blog, excuse me, CCC blog, uh, which is a weekly blog, mostly structured around uh, different themes, uh, but also offering special commentary pieces. And you can, of course, check that out. Again, the link is in the blog. Um, and we also now publish uh, an annual curated collection of pieces from the Contemporary China Center blog. Uh, as well with the University of Westminster Press. So again, hopefully some of you have seen this popping up on your social media feeds. It's the Cultural China 2020, which is, um, as I said, a curated collection of pieces from the Contemporary China Center uh, blog. And so it's a unique publication featuring up-to-date, informed and accessible commentary about Chinese and Sinophone languages, cultural practices, politics, production and their critical analysis. So that was published in November 2021 and it is available open access um, and it's free to download and for purchase in uh, paperback as well through the University of Westminster Press website. So moving on to our event today. So we're very, very honored to have two excellent uh, speakers who will be focusing on the topic which is changing discourses and practices of reproduction in the People's Republic of China. And this event comes at a very particular point in time. Uh, so many of you will know that last year the Chinese government announced that uh, married couples across the country would now be allowed to have up to three children, right? And that, of course, marked quite a dramatic reversal of the uh, one child policy, which as many of you will know, was first enacted in 1979 to limit Chinese couples to one child. Um, also last year, uh, though a few months later, the, the government declared that it would now seek to reduce abortions for non-medical purposes. Uh, and this was a move that many saw as part of state efforts uh, to counter falling birth rates and an aging population across the country. Now, at the same time, births in Xinjiang were also reportedly, uh, reportedly plummeted amidst the ongoing crackdown by the state uh, against Uyghurs and other minority groups in the region. 
So given that very particular context in recent years, today we ask, what do these various shifts in rhetoric and policy mean for how we understand questions of reproductive justice and injustice and gender equality and inequality in contemporary China? So who is affected, how and why? What forms of support, resistance and uh, negotiation perhaps have emerged in response to these various changes and shifts? And what might we learn by placing these trends within a broader historical and global context as well? So these are just some of the questions that we've asked our speakers today uh, to reflect on uh, based on their own areas of research. So we'll be touching on a wide array of questions, questions about discourse and policy around uh, reproduction, including issues such as healthcare, uh, reproductive technologies, education, public awareness campaigns, activism, uh, the right to parent, and so on. And we're very pleased to announce that this event will also introduce a new collection of Chinese propaganda posters about the one child policy, and birth control methods in uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, these posters will be available um, at the University of Westminster Archive in the next academic year. So you'll be able to check those out um, very, very soon. So I want to now introduce uh, our two excellent speakers for the event today. Uh, I'll start with Sarah Mellers Rodriguez, who is an assistant uh, professor of East Asian history at Missouri State University. So Sarah's forthcoming book, Reproductive Realities in China, Birth Control and Abortion, 1911 to 2021, is coming out with Cambridge University Press uh, this year and uses interviews and archival research to analyze how ordinary people, particularly women, uh, navigated China's shifting fertility policies both before and during the one child policy era. So Sarah, we're all really looking forward to that book. It's gonna be an exciting contribution to these discussions. Um, Kailing Xie, so our next speaker, Kailing. Kailing is a lecturer in international development at the University of Birmingham. Uh, so Kailing's work investigates the underlying social, cultural and political tensions underpinning China's economic success through the lens of gender. Uh, so Kailing's book, Embodying Middle Class Gender Aspirations, Perspectives from China's Privileged Young Women, uh, came out last year with Palgrave Macmillan and throws light on how gender affects the lives of well-educated urban Chinese women born in the 1980s. Right? So this is a really fascinating um, book that examines gendered attitudes in China to marriage, to reproductive choices, to career choices and aspirations for a good life. Um, so both speakers will be talking about their work and then my colleague, uh, Professor Gerda Wielander is Professor in Chinese Studies and Associate Head of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at, here at the University of Westminster and Gerda will be speaking about this new exciting collection of propaganda posters um, that we um, yeah that we've been gifted here at the at the university so a couple of things before we jump into the event uh, just a little in terms of the structure of the event today to begin with uh, so Sarah and Kyling will both speak for about 15 minutes each uh, and after that, Gerda will say a few words about our very special collection of posters here, and we'll then open it up for uh, the discussion uh, for Q&A. Right? So pretty kind of straightforward breakdown of what we're doing. Um, so just one quick point about housekeeping as well for the event today. So I guess given, uh, you know, sadly, given how prone topics like the one that we're discussing today are, to Zoom bombing and other forms of derailing and dis dis disruption, we've decided that the, the safest and most sensible option today is that we, we mute, um, we mute uh, all audience uh, participants. So you can, of course, use the chat function, and we really encourage you to do so. Uh, so you can use the chat function to um, you know, share your comments, your questions, and so on. 
um, but those will only be viewable to myself and the rest of the Contemporary China Center team, right? We've got um, two of our brilliant PhD students who are helping with moderation today, Fei and Xiao. Uh, so all of your questions and comments will just come to us. They won't be uh, made public. Uh, so we do this in the interest of ensuring the smooth running of the event and also, of course, to protect our speakers and to protect uh, audience participants as well. Uh, so we hope you can understand that particular setup. And we'll do our very best, of course, to share all your comments and questions with the speakers when it comes to the Q&A session. Uh, and finally, of course, this is an academic event. It's promoting free and respectful discussion, and we expect all participant participation today to adhere to that spirit. Okay, so that's uh, enough from me. Uh, so now, without further ado, let's kick things off. Uh, so Sarah, um, I'll hand things over to you. I'm just going to pin, add pin, there we go. I'll add things over to you. The floor is yours, Sarah. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, the famous first line of every uh, webinar presentation. Can you see my screen? Anyway, thank you so much um, for having me here today. So I'm going to start uh, by briefly introducing my research. I'm not really gonna touch on my research too much in the uh, context of this presentation, but if you um, would like to ask me particular questions about it in the Q&A, that's totally fine. And then I'll move on to uh, the kind of meat of the presentation. So since its enactment in 1979, um, the one child policy, as we all know, has been the focus of, of publications and discourse in a lot of different fields. Yet most scholarship tends to focus exclusively on the role of the state and tends to give short shrift to the decades preceding the policy's implementation. So my forthcoming book takes grassroots contraception and abortion from the early, early 20th century to the present as its focus. Uh, it focuses on the long durée. Um, and I draw on the oral histories of 80 women and men in three different Chinese cities to expose the messy realities of local fertility policy implementation, the ways in which government officials and individuals challenged, reworked, and co-opted state policies to suit their own interests, and the enduring precariousness of state control over reproduction. My presentation today, however, offers a broad overview of China's changing fertility policies and discourses. And it, it highlights the fact that official attitudes toward fertility have in some ways fluctuated greatly over the last 100 years. And yet at the local level, change has been much less drastic. So to begin, uh, let's go way back, because I'm a historian. Um, in the mid 19th century, uh, the Qing dynasty faced mounting internal and external threats to its rule. As you probably are well aware, dissatisfied with the state of trade relations with China, the British launched the Opium Wars, which opened up China to more imperialist advances and eventually led to the fall of the Qing dynasty in 1911 and the establishment of the Republic of China in 1912. Shortly after that, in the early 1920s, eugenic discourses linking individual health to national strength began gaining currency among Chinese intellectuals. And the visit of birth control pioneer Margaret Sanger to China in 1922 further fueled elite preoccupation with using contraception to improve the quality of the population by limiting births among the poor and those deemed unfit. While sterilization and abortion were technically prohibited, contraception, contraception itself was neither uh, explicitly endorsed nor banned at the national level, leaving it up to local authorities to police it as they saw fit. Though many were neither safe nor particularly effective, in reality, a wide range of contraceptive and abortive medicines were available to women in urban China in the Republican period. I'll give you an example. This, this is an advertisement for a, a so-called birth control product. I love this one because it has the stork that, that's been captured in rope. <laughs> um, here we have a product, an advertisement for a product that 
purport to do all sorts of things. It's not only a contraceptive, but it regularizes menstruation and it even prevents the spread of STDs and other things. It does it all. Um, and then we have a picture of an imported condom um, that would have come from the UK or from Britain at this time. So despite the availability of all of these kinds of products, abortion appears to have been the most common form of fertility regulation that at least appears in the historical record. And primary reasons for using contraceptives or undergoing an abortion appear to have been poverty, not wanting a, an affair to be discovered, fearing the loss of a job due to pregnancy or concerns about the detrimental social implications of premarital sex. Although women, urban women from all walks of life, um, according to the historical record, were undergoing abortions or using abortifacients, the, a majority of abortion seekers caught by the police tended to be working class because wealthier women were generally sheltered from legal repercussions. Immediately after the founding of the PRC, the People's Republic of China in 1949, the government severely limited access to birth control, abortion, and sterilization because it viewed a large population as a boon to the workforce and the economy. Following the Soviet model then, women were encouraged to have as many children as possible with rewards for, for mothers who had the most children. I've chosen a, a propaganda poster here that I think nicely embodies the spirit of the day. Dad goes to work, we go to school. The implication being the woman's role is primarily as wife and mother. She's probably a stay at home mom. And she has this um, large family of happy, healthy children who are there to support the burgeoning nation. By the mid 1950s though, census results revealed that grain production really could not keep pace with um, the growing population. Um, and there was also a greater desire to, to mobilize women into the workforce. Um, so to have fewer stay at home moms. Um, and this led to a gradual loosening of restrictions on contraceptives, abortions and sterilizations and the first national campaign to promote family planning. Here I have a few images of what some kind of artifacts from that movement. On the, the left here um, are some, <laughs> some reproductive guides that were issued in the mid fifties that would have introduced women and couples to contraceptives. This thing in the middle is a poster that um, would have probably been hung in like a factory or a dorm or um, a health clinic, introducing people to um, <laughs> how to main use and maintain condoms for a long period of time. So up to six uses per condom, yum. Um, and then this final item is uh, a rhythm method cal calendar that was recommended for uh, women to, to plan intercourse based on their menstrual cycles to reduce the chances of conception. But as, as contraceptives became more widely available, women cadres and workers, as well as urban residents, gained preferential access to family planning. Meanwhile, women in poorer households, those living in rural areas, and individuals with lower education levels were often left to fend for themselves. At this time, poor quality contraceptives, high prices and conflicting policies also limited family planning options. In China, birth control uh, in the past as today is linked to women's biological roles as wives and mothers, and therefore is viewed as a, primarily a female responsibility. As such, family planning propaganda or birth planning propaganda as it's called in the PRC, largely targeted women and women's bodies. And due to a combination of gendered state policies and male resistance, male sterilizations and condoms never played as significant of a role in family planning as women-centered birth control methods. Yet even at the time of this initial birth planning um, campaign, officials in the upper echelons of the CCP were still ambivalent about family planning. In fact, they officially argued that birth control was only needed to create greater spacing between births, something that would improve maternal and fetal health, not to limit population growth per se. And, 
And so in 1957, when intellectuals called for greater access to birth control for the purpose of limiting the population, um, they were silenced. In 1958, the Communist Party launched the Great Leap Forward, a campaign to enact rapid industrialization and agricultural collectivization that resulted in approximately 30 million deaths in three years, um, mostly due to man-made famine. Um, from this chart, you can see, this is a chart of birth rate from approximately the founding of the PRC till nearly the present. And we can see that the only time that the death rate actually exceeded the birth rate is during the height of the Great Leap Forward. Um, from this, we can also see that there are peaks in the birth rate first in the early years of the PRC when there is limited access to, um, to contraceptives. And then there's another peak in the kind of wake of the Great Leap Forward that ends up leading to the second major campaign to limit births. So the Great Leap Forward's failure uh, made the need for family planning even more urgent. And the state began encouraging late marriage or delayed marriage to shorten the time period in which individuals are able to reproduce since there was a kind of baseline assumption that reproduction only takes place between married people. So if you limit the time in which people are married, they'll be having fewer children. And this movement dovetailed with efforts to uh, integrate women into the workforce. So propaganda posters start promoting this idea of, of delayed marriage and family planning as a way to empower women. The implication being if a woman um, waits a couple more years before getting married. She can have the joys of being an industrial worker. She can participate in scientific research or help um, on the commune, et cetera. In 1966, Chairman Mao launched the Cultural Revolution, a political movement intended to destroy the ossifying bureaucratic class. Despite the social dis dislocation caused by this movement, birth planning propaganda increased steadily from the late 1960s onward. Here are some pictures. These are from a little bit later, but I think they nicely demonstrate what the kind of day-to-day -day, uh, interfacing with propaganda, birth planning propaganda would have looked like. Here we have people who are just on the street, I think it's in Wuhan, and they're um, looking at posters that are demonstrating not only the values of family planning, birth planning, but that they're, they're juxtaposed with posters about production. So we see that there's a direct link between limiting births and increasing state production. And here's an, another picture of an early health class where it, it's notable that all of the people in the audience are actually women, not surprising because they're supposedly the target of most of these interventions. The fact that they would have been eligible for a class that is explicitly discusses birth planning means that these young women probably were recently married, which meant that they were um, part of the target group for this type of, of discussion. Um, so from the, the, throughout the 1970s, the state tightened restrictions on births incrementally, yet these policies on the ground were extremely uneven. In many cases, married urbanites were encouraged and later forced to engage in family planning, whereas unmarried rural residents were actually punished for practicing it. Believing that the only way to further improve the economy was through drastically, even more drastically limiting births, the state encouraged families first to have just three children under the later longer fewer policy, and then just two children under the one is best, two at most, Policy. And finally, it arrives at, at the famous one child policy in 1979, where families are encouraged to have just one child. And the, as we can see from uh, these posters, the implication is that limiting one's family size is, is really essential, not only for economic growth, but for, the, for modernization, for the development of the, the nation, and for producing chubby, ruddy little babies like this one. So everybody's benefiting when there's fewer births. A system of punishments and rewards was used from, from the 1970s onward, was used to enforce the policy with one child families being given privileged access to education and housing and the like. While punishments were violating the policy ranged from fines to mandatory abortion 
uh, or sterilization or even worse things. In 1984, in response to widespread rural resistance to the policy, restrictions were actually relaxed in some places. And after that, only about one third of the population of China continued to fall under the original policy. Yet the name one child policy endured, even though two thirds of the country was eligible with some kind of caveats to have more than one child. During this period, the 1980s uh, and beyond, some of the overtly eugenic discourses that had come to the floor during the 1920s and 1930s reemerged and actually became a standard part of family planning propaganda. For example, the central government emphasized the administration of premarital and prenatal checkups with the goal of, again, improving the quality of the population. In fact, people with certain hereditary diseases, venereal disease, or mental conditions were prohibited from marrying and reproducing. Um, and in some cases, those individuals were forcibly sterilized. In 2016, in response to the steeply declining birth rate, the one-child policy was formally replaced with a two-child policy. And then in 2021, the policy was again relaxed and a three-child policy was enacted. With more than 18% of the population over 60, the central government is now, as, as mentioned in the introduction, encouraging larger families to support the growing population and supplement the dwindling workforce. So in conclusion, reproduction has long played a central role in state modernization efforts. Between 1911 and 1949, the nationalists supported a policy of what I'm calling controlled natalism, wherein abortions and sterilizations were legally restricted, but in reality, a vast underground economy for birth control and abortion existed. After the communists came to power in 1949, initially contraceptives and abortions were banned or severely restricted. However, grain shortages and labor inefficiency, and also the fact that a lot of women who were pregnant at work were having miscarriages um, or even losing their menstrual cycles due to uh, poor nutrition and overworking. Um, this led to a uh, loosening of these restrictions, which paved the way for aggressive population control from the late 1970s onward. All the while, the timeline intensity and even the methods of policy enforcement remained inconsistent. And in the long term, women have borne the brunt of these changes. The obsession with increasing and then decreasing fertility and now increasing it again has enabled greater and greater state interference into private life and a focus on the intimate details of women's personal lives and bodies. Alrighty, that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a really uh, a fantastic and impressively comprehensive <laughs> historical overview and historical analysis of, of um, of reproductive uh, discourses and policy. And I really enjoyed uh, hearing what you had to say about those different posters as well. It's really fantastic. Uh, Kyling, over to you. I'm just going to add a pin and yeah, off you go, Kyling. Right, thank you. Can you hear me? Just checking. Um, Perfect. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Great. Can you see my PowerPoint now? Excellent. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for this opportunity to share my work. And I really, really love the beginning of the first slide that Sarah shared because that's one of my favorite posters. And I'm very looking forward to see more posters later that are going to share with us as well. Um, so I think Sarah has given us a very comprehensive like um, backdrop of the development of the China's family planning and policies. So I think um, I might my presentation might have a little bit overlap. So I'll just jump skip those and then try to focus. Hopefully, give more focus on the attitude um, among women themselves and how they perceive reproductions and um, choices in in contemporary China. So. Um, I think Sarah already mentioned this kind of gradual development of China's uh, population policy, but I'm just gonna quickly um, 
presented in my way because I find it fascinating that if you see the whole well starting from the establishment of a People's Republic China back in 1949 you will see there was at the initial stage was this kind of encouragement of a childbirth because it was understood during Mao, uh, Mao era as a good for uh, um, good for the nation building and quickly um, the state gradually realized uh, starting to perceive the population as a threat to economic development. And you're starting to see the slogans promoted by the states. For example, the stage two, you will see that in um, early 1970s, I love this slogan because I think it's especially relevant for uh, for today. As the state particularly said, um, translate into English would be basically one child is not too few, two are just right, and three are too many. I think in some way, in many ways, it's quite sarcastic to read it today. And then since then, the state has gradually basically built up towards the beginning of 1980s, this kind of strict, strict uh, birth control and family planning, and that we call the so-called one-child policy. And then um, you can see that move to the stage three, the one-child policy, family planning become the fundamental policy in China, as well as a part of the constitutional duty for the citizens. So, um, however, as we move along, um, at the beginning of the millennium 2002 till now, we see this kind of gradual loosening of family planning. And we see, for example, 2011, November, there were two child policies started actually um, before we, what we know this kind of nationwide implementation. It was first started for married couple who are both the only child. Yeah. So, and then later on, it um, somehow being spread to, to encourage, well, to allow allow couples at least, uh, well, at, as long as one of them is the only child, they can have two children. And then later um, to 2016, we see this kind of nationwide two-child policy started. And then last year, we see the so-called opening up to the three-child policy um, across China. So I think that I just want to give you this overview because within um, how many, I think a few decades, we see this kind of almost U-term of Chinese reproductive policy. Maybe it's kind of easy later. Um, maybe I will say a little bit more later. I think it's kind of easy for the state to just ch change its policy um, on paper. But I would personally, I would argue that it's much more difficult to sw uh, switch people's attitude uh, once you have somehow changed it um, because of these kind of macro structural shifts. So and another thing I would like to highlight is that alongside of this changing policy, the China census, I think Sarah already mentioned that the reason that we see the, uh, the going back, well, not going back, but uh, allow the population to have more children, especially now the under three child policy, is the idea and understanding that the China, uh, the China census for 2011 to 20, um, that shows the population was, was growing at its slowest rate in decades. So there was this kind of perceived population in crisis and together with its fast aging population and dropping birth rates has uh, somehow ra raised this kind of alarm bells to the government. And um, somehow um, the state has come, come to the consensus that now we really need to encourage birth to continue uh, strengthening the nation building exercise in the current moment in time. So this kind of sh shift, to, shift to policy, well, in my view, obviously, it, well, unavoidably would uh, increase the demand of the, especially the reproductive labor um, that is still predominantly carried out by Chinese women. As you can see, I love this uh, picture because it does highlight the, uh, the this kind of upside down pyramid shape of Chinese demographic. Uh, outlook. You can see the, uh, the older generation, the aging population, shouldered by the working population, the married couple, and the married couple need to somehow, um, now under the current policy, is expected to produce more children to somehow continue the, uh, the, uh, the growing nation the, uh, in the next decades. Another element I think it's really important to highlight is that because of the population control and planning policy, especially one child policy, China, and in, I'm, I'm I believe many of you have come across this information uh, somewhere else, is this kind of widening, well, the, the, this kind of widening gender ratio at birth. So China actually have a severely screwed sex ratio with more men and women. Contrary to the media sensation towards China's so-called leftover single women after the age of 27, the issues faced by a large number of poor rural men are rarely discussed in the media. So that's something I think it's very important to bear in mind um, that why that is the case, hopefully my presentation would provide some um, an answer to this. 
So China's bare branches, and these are most likely uh, rural men who are located at the bottom of the China's social economic ladder. And then they, um, they are, well, traditionally, historically understood as bare branches because they are a derogatory term used to describe these unmarried men who are unable to bear so-called fruits, children, to carry on their family names. So they are often uh, migrant workers coming from the poor rural families and their economic positions located at the bottom end of the hierarchy which often make them to be perceived as unruly laborers or a potential threat to China's social stabilities. Therefore, the state is trying to tackle it as a so-called social problem. And I think it's intriguing, especially recently, uh, maybe some of you have noticed the news about um, a, a woman who had a child, well, well I think in many ways, in many ways, she was basically locked up and chained and had eight children and locked up in this uh, rural villages in China. And this story basically uh, attracted a lot of media attention in China. Um, a lot of people um, trying to use this news to say that, look, we really need to address this, this issue as well. However, unfortunately, this, this news were quickly somehow censored and controlled and brought back to the mainstream um, state discourse about this and in many ways uh, silenced. But I think this does somehow reveal the hidden reality of the rural population and how the, the, the concern over this kind of bare branches and um, the, from the rural population that might jeopardize China's so-called uh, social stabilities. The, in terms of rural families, that is, well, many of you might also come, come across the term of so-called left behind children or elders. But and instead of saying they are left behind, that is, well, in some way erase their, their agency. Some of them might well, a lot of them probably choose to stay behind because they are not really everybody, not everybody welcome the so-called China's urbanization project. However, we do have this phenomenon of the rural population are predominantly now occupied by young children and elders, which also uh, reveal the problems uh, of care. And the burden of care is still uh, very much an issue that needs to be addressed. And the China's entrenched rural urban divide embedded in its, um, its early development policies means that its rural areas are often suffer from underdevelopment. So I think this kind of un imbalance is something that really somehow drive the current po uh, policy shifts and not only the, the population policy, but also, for example, the current common prosperity uh, project that is uh, advocated by President Xi Jinping. But how effective it is and it remains to be seen. So um, hopefully that has highlighted, painted the picture of the wider picture of the so-called population in crisis. And my argument is uh, from based on my research is the state is trying to solve the, these crises by consolidating the heterosexual family regime as the still to, to this day, still the only legitimate site for reproduction. So that is not only to say that, yes, we need to have more children, but it's a particular kind of uh, ch uh, childbirth and child rearing is anticipated by the state and regulated as well. So you can see that the two news article here that um, there were, well, last year as well, there was adding a cooling off period um, to trying to calm down young couples who um, impulsively divorced and trying to stabilize the, um, the, the marriage um, regime. At the same time, we see the shift towards the three child policy as well. So um, besides the so called controlling population quantity, it is also important for us to bear in mind that this uh, the one child policy and population planning comes hand in hand with the idea of improving population quality. So, so the Chinese term su zhi quality is very much um, embedded within the implementation of uh, one child policy since the 1980s. So this is a very much um, a eugenic sort of uh, ideas and practice being spread out across country alongside of the one child policy to encourage uh, the, the population to have excellent birth and excellent rearing. So you can see that expectation how to have excellent birth is po um, policing women's reproductive body in terms of its age, in terms of its practices, as well as how to educate the next generation of uh, Chinese children. And that plays a lot of emphasize on education, family education, as well as public education. And obviously, ultimately, this has trickle down effects on the pressure on the family and how, mu how much and how they should raise up their children, how to educate them to be considered as qualified and modern Chinese citizens. 
So these kind of like hand in hand or control, uh, controlling quantity, improving quality is part of large sort of China's ambition to become to become modernized. So we, um, I think in this in this way, we can see that um, the population uh, policies is very much part of this kind of nation building exercises and individuals, men and women, as well as individual families are very much tied into this kind of governing logic. That is what I'm trying to argue in my book. So as I have given you this background of um, this idea of uh, high quality birth and excellent the childbirth and ex excellent rearing, um, my book embodying middle class gender aspiration perspective from China's privileged young women is very much looking into the so called this kind of privileged group. Yeah, the privileged group in the sense that they are very well educated and then they are were all urban citizens and born into urban family under the one child policy. Actually, in my participants, they are all uh, born in the 1980s, which for, uh, makes them become um, a part of this kind of first generation of one chi uh, only child. So they were growing up in the 1990s when China were going through this kind of rapid urbanization and development stages, witness this kind of accumulation of um, national wealth, especially in the urban area. So these uh, these these women who were born into the urban family were privileged because of, of their urban birth, because they have easier access to a better education and healthcare. And then the family in the urban areas, the one child policy was much better implemented because of the different uh, reproductive models um, in comparison to the rural, rural areas. So um, in that case, family were able to invest a huge amount of resources into their only child, regardless of their gender. So that's what we see. Uh, many scholars have uh, have uh, uh, argued that we, because of this, this kind of disparities, we see the unintended consequences in China of by the one-child policy. That we see this large amount of um, well sorry, large amount of family resources invested into their only daughters, especially urban only daughters, that give them um, easier access to enter a university education. And because of their edu uh, edu higher education, that will enable them to uh, secure jobs in the, uh, in the cities, most, uh, most likely those white collar professions that are highly re um, respected in, in China, and then which allows them to become part of China's so-called rising middle class. So all these kind of privileged backgrounds allow the uh, particular cohort of women um, to become this kind of rising star in China's this kind of modernization project in many ways. And but at the same time, because of their, pri their privilege, because of their education and urban um, urban residency, as well as the, the, they are the rising middle class, they also paradoxically become the target of the, uh, the current sort of um, changing of policy. Because I would, I would argue that it is exactly this kind of uh, a population cohort um, are expected to reproduce, to have more children, because they actually have the um, expected resources in terms of educating better quality children for the next generation. And well-educated women would, well, will somehow become so-called good mothers uh, for the nation in many ways. So I think and that's why we see these women are often being um, pressurized in both by the in the state media as well as um, in uh, by their families. And uh, I think that's a, an, another layer we, we can um, have discussion about. And maybe I don't have time to go into it. Uh, maybe we would um, in answer some of the question if you have in our uh, discussion. How am I doing with time? Do I still have time? Uh, maybe two minutes. Okay, so in that case, I'm just gonna quickly uh, sum up. So in my book, I basically trying to follow this kind of reproductive sort of deadlines that is prescribed in many ways prescribed to these women, as you can see in these pictures. And if you're in China, you're age of 22, you finish university degrees, and then before you reach the age of 27, which is supposedly the deadline for marriage, otherwise you will be um, labeled as leftover women, you have about five years to both find a, a secure career as well as pin down a husband. And then and before the age of 30s, that's the understood as the end of the ideal time for pregnancies, and you need to have your first child at least under the current three child policy. 
And then because of this kind of eugenic uh, beliefs and thinkings and practices uh, that is widespread, um, 35 is understood as the alarming deadline for risky pregnancy. So you can say that hopefully this gives you this idea of the heightened um, pressure and tensions that individual women um, face in order to hit all these targets that is, um, um, that is very much embedded in the social expectations. So my book is basically following this uh, trajectory to um, il illustrate how the, this so-called privileged women navigate this kind of um, multiple contradictions and tensions in their adult life. I don't have time to go into details into each chapters, but if I may just quickly um, conclude, for if you ask me the shifting attitude about uh, the the yeah, this contemporary in contemporary China about. Uh, uh, reproductions. I would say that what I observed among this kind of um, privileged women's uh, cohort, there is this kind of very interesting um, phenomenon. On one hand, we see this kind of rising in neoliberal desirable self that is very much self-driven, entrepreneurial, that want to be very much successful, and both in their career as well as in their family life. That is, that is very much understood as this kind of Chinese version of life success for women. I call it as a gendered, um, uh, gendered uh, success, yeah, middle-class identity. So how to embody that is basically a very much difficult journey for the individual women, even, even despite their privileges. Uh, so this, my, um, this idea of this particular version of success, mei man jia ting, happy full family, might drive certain, uh, some women to embody this kind of con conventional uh, life trajectory, despite its difficulties. However, on the other hand, interestingly, we also see this kind of the same kind of neoliberal self-driving desire self would also um, prohibit them to somehow become, to retreat back to this kind of traditional uh, space, become completely sort of dom domesticated, because that is also go against their understanding of what is, what is a successful, uh, modern, um, desirable individual. So I think that is also something that um, will be interesting to, to look at in, uh, in the next decade to how they actually navigate within the current pol uh, policy landscapes. So if I may quickly conclude, the three child policy, a happy ending. And then if I map this Chinese character, if those of you are familiar with Chinese character like this, how, which is good, goodness, and which is basically um, constituted by, on one side is women, nu, and the other side is, which is like a son. Yeah, if you put them together, it's good. Everything's perfect. So will people, in order to embody this particular social expect, expected version of success, will people to choose have um, to have two, two children? Uh, my, don't quote me. My personal ex um, observation is some of them, yeah, um, yes, they will, because of this kind of the privileges, social privilege they might have, they are able to afford to um, have two children in order to embody this kind of both, both have one son and one daughter to present this kind of socially desirable image. However, it is very much a stratificated like um, in, on this kind of social hierarchy, only those who have resources are able to enjoy this kind of um, socially desirable success version of happy family life. On the other hand, final note, we must also recognize that China is also witnessing a uh, Feminist awakenings, despite of the state crackdown since um, since 2015, I would say, and some of you might remember there was this famous revision of NGO regulation in China that prohibit foreign fundings to support NGOs, and then that in the same year we also saw this kind of uh, the feminist five got arrested, basically young women who trying to pr um, promote gender equality in China. And then in recent, well, last year, Chinese social media platform, Douban actually shut down over 10 online feminist groups. And, but despite that, I think it's also indicate, despite the st state crackdown, we, we do see the Chinese feminists are still very active, both online and offline. And they're self-organizing and trying to, there are different ideas, contending discourses um, alongside of the state discourse, despite the state trying to tightly control it. So I would say that despite the facing an uphill struggles and China with this burgeoning independent feminist movement, that will be very difficult to crack down. Therefore, the discourse about reproduction in China is not entirely dominated by the states. And then to some extent, hopefully to a large extent, is now in the hand of the individual women. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you, Kailin. It was a really fantastic discussion. Um, and a 
I feel like it really, you know, you've made so, such really important points. I think particularly the kind of heterosex, uh, the com com compulsory heterosexual uh, family regime and the very particular kind of prescribed biological roadmaps that, that leads to, right? The very kind of narrow definition of what life success looks like and, and how that plays out through class and gender and rural urban divides and so on. So really fantastic paper. And I think back to back with Sarah's paper, um, it, it, it kind of, uh, yeah, it prepares, prepares the ground for lots of really interesting discussions. Thank you so much. Um, so, so I guess I mentioned at the beginning of this talk um, that uh, we also have, um, we are planning on introducing a new collection of Chinese propaganda posters about the one child policy and birth control methods. We've seen quite a few of those um, already in uh, Sarah's and uh, Kylie's presentation. So now um, I'll invite my colleague, Gerda to say a little bit about this new collection that we've got here at the University of uh, Westminster. So Gerda, over to you. Hi, thank you. And <clears throat> I need to apologize because I have a terrible voice and an awful cough and I get sort of randomly assaulted by an urge to sneeze that may or may not actually materialize. So could be some awkward uh, moments uh, in the next few minutes. I just want to thank both Sarah and Kailing for their excellent presentations and also so much uh, that I you know, recognize all the posters that you will see shortly. But just in picking up on Shay's point just now about the urban rural divide, I am not directly linked to the one child policy, but certainly linked to sort of this notion of eugenics and, and, and sort of this um, split between the urban and the rural is, I don't know, you, most of you will be aware of uh, Scott Rosell and Natalie Hill's book, Invisible China, but that's what I've been reading recently. And I mean, it's just fantastic. Uh, and an eye opener in terms of the lack of uh, funding of education uh, in, you know, this, if, if, if we want to take, if we should take seriously this claim of, a, you know, wanting, you know, the higher soldier, uh, whatever that is, uh, of, of its population, the state obviously has very seriously neglected investment in education uh, in rural areas. So I can, I really can recommend uh, that book very highly. So I'll just also share my screen and hopefully shall not fail at that endeavor. Um, I think you should be seeing that. I'm not going to, so, so, so unlike my two, uh, the two Sarah's and Kylie's presentation, this is not a research presentation. I haven't got, I haven't done any profound research on this. It's really a introduction to a new um, collection of posters that were donated to us uh, last summer. Uh, they were donated to us by Professor Cecilia Milbert, um, a Danish academic, um, and she, well, among many, many books, I've her 1996 uh, work that, I've, that I'm citing here on this slide, Accepting Population Control, uh, Urban Chinese Women and the One Child uh, Family Policy. I believe that that is her, uh, the work from her dissertation actually. And many of the, uh, many of the sources, uh, so the, the posters that she has donated to us also informed her research of this particular publication of her dissertation. So that's why I am only mentioning this one book of hers. Um, she donated these posters, there are about a, probably more than a hundred, I haven't counted each one, but there's a hundred plus post posters that are dating from the 1980s and 1990s um, on family planning more generally. Actually, most of them are not dated. They don't actually have a date on them uh, for us to, to really, to really uh, locate them in their time period. I did ask Cecilia, uh, you know, what she remembered of collecting them and she, she thought they were mostly from the 1980s and, uh, and mostly she just bought them uh, during her trips to China, but with the, definitely some of the posters actually from a conference of 1995. So it's, uh, it's sort of a slightly wider time range, perhaps. They have uh, become, they, they are now in, available in our archives. Uh, you know, we, you may be aware, as Jay already mentioned, our Chinese visual arts project. Uh, the posters have not yet been catalogued, um, so they're not yet available um, online, but uh, they can, 
if you are interested in looking at them, uh, it's possible to, to see them by uh, making an appointment through um, our archive. Um, so I want to, I have uh, sort of spent uh, several hours with this new donation and basically uh, tried to sort of classify them and put them into, into, into or identify a number of different types or categories of posters. Um, and I will just introduce five of these categories today. Sorry, this slide, I've, I've lost my cursor. There it is again. Um, <clears throat> I will only introduce five of these categories that I was able to identify um, today, not all of them. The first, um, the first category I've called uh, painted education. And of course I have these samples for you, um, but they are a series of 18 posters uh, which are all in the same style um, and that are numbered. Uh, so there may have been more than 18, but we certainly have uh, a, a, the continuous uh, series from one to 18, which basically provide illustrated information on the on population planning more widely. I think you shouldn't say the one child policy, but uh, more widely and various different measures within it. Uh, they consist of two introductory posters and then 16 uh, specific topics. So just to give you an example, uh, that is the first uh, of the 18, the introduction. What I want to say about the posters also more generally is I think that they are, you know, much research has of course been done on this, on the topic and on this time period, I mean, not least for Cecilia Millworth herself and of course, excellent colleagues like Sarah uh, and, and Kailing. I, I don't know how much more new information they will yield on you know, family planning specifically. I think they are a good resource though, uh, and an interesting resource when it comes to design, uh, you know, post design, uh, semiotics, uh, and uh, not just you know, references political dis of political discourse, but also uh, visual references. Uh, so I think visual references, for example, in this particular case of earlier period, um, as I said, we don't have uh, dates, the posters don't carry dates, but this surely must be sort of, I, surely I would say it must be from the 80s. There is so much uh, visual references uh, to, to, to posters and, and things and elements that we see in, in, in from posters from the 60s and the 70s even. And, you know, I don't want, not going to go into, don't want to take too much time. But they are quite intricate um, and, 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 and full and detailed uh, posters, as you can see. So this is a sort of a more general introduction providing and setting out the rationale for introducing family planning. Um, and then uh, sort of a, uh, a, a another, another more general introductory poster that situates, uh, you know, the Chinese family and the Chinese population in, 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 in the world population, as you can see from the different faces and different types of people. And uh, at the center, I just want to highlight it at the center, this circle, um, uh, we, we have these three faces, these profiles of different, these three different profiles in three different colors and uh, against the a backdrop of the globe. And that reappears again in the, on the poster from 1995, uh, the, these conference posters uh, that, I, that I mentioned. So there is also from a design perspective um, and from a sort of developing logos, developing recognizable symbols, I think these posters could also be um, a, really, uh, a really useful resource. Um, I've just picked out, as I said, these are the two cover posters of this particular series of 18. And I just picked out two further specific ones. So here, for example, each of the 16 themes, um, uh, so each poster focuses on uh, a particular topic. So for example, population and the natural and natural resources um, and the world, you know, the situation of the world population, uh, you know, then China's uh, population development and so forth. I've just picked this one here. Uh, about um, sort of ecological uh, balance, which seems to, again, nowadays, of course, we hear also there's a lot of, um, you know, the sort of ecological, ecological focus, but uh, that, that's why I chose this one, uh, you know, just linking, linking population and, uh, and the environment. So all the time providing every single poster, providing a reason why uh, population needs to be controlled and in what way um, human population links in with the wider environment, be that the natural environment or even the world population and of course, um, the Chinese economy. 
And then uh, I also picked up this one, which of course um, links back to what uh, what Kailing also said about uh, you know caring, and it's a good uh, you know it's a good uh, reproduction and a good child rearing, and you can see uh, you know this this uh, responsibility as well of you know bringing up the next generation, and I picked it mostly because it clearly is a is is a uniquely female task uh, to bring up uh, the next generation. So um, that is uh, so that is one uh, that is one category, uh, and these eighteen posters uh, provide rich rich uh, material uh, to to get to get stuck into. It's even just the color, even just the choice of colors uh, is interesting in them. Um, the second uh, category I've, I've called metaphor and modernism. Uh, these are five very glossy posters, which these ones actually name the designers and artistic directors that, uh, that, have, uh, that have contributed to their production, their creation and production. And they follow a particular pattern of having a sort of poetic metaphors uh, against the very artistic backgrounds. Um, but these metaphors in sort of in, in a sort of pithy and short uh, poetic form effectively bring out the same types of connections that are made in those painted education posters that I just introduced. Uh, these also have interestingly have English translations as, as, as titles. So there's one example here. I'm sorry, I photographed these in the archive and there's a light right above. So there's a bit, bit of a reflection and these were also quite shiny. They are quite shiny in there finish as opposed to the previous ones that are matte. But you can see what I mean with sort of uh, metaphor and modernism. They have a very interesting uh, color choices, these posters. Unfortunately, again, while they provide a lot of information about those whose work went into creating and producing them, they actually don't carry a date. You can see what I mean. <clears throat> so there are these, um, uh, all, all of them have uh, four lines of four characters. I mean, and, and in this in this particular case, uh, you know, linking, for example, you know, resources, uh, nat natural resources to the to the population, and how it is important for, uh, in the in the context of a limited limited treasures, um, to 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 keep a keep a balance there. Uh, this is just a, a bit more of a detail. Uh, very different colorways to the propaganda posters of previous years, of course. So it's sort of a very modernist uh, mid-century palette here. Um, and that's the second example from this particular series. Again, picking up the theme, the, the ecological theme here um, and the environment. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of a second uh, type uh, of poster. Now, we also have, uh, as, a, as part of the collection, a number of what are, could be, you know, look like, are made to look like calligraphic scrolls, uh, and I call them calligraphic exhortations. There are six different ones. In fact, there are more because some, there were quite a few duplicates, but there are six different ones. And each of these scroll names the calligrapher and also the seal cutter. So here's, uh, here's one example. So you can see why I would call them calligraphic exhortations. So uh, just very straightforward, clear, uh, laying it down, what, 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 it, what the slogan of the day, but in, in a traditional form. And each of them has uh, a different style of calligraphy, hence the named calligrapher. And also each of them has a different seal, uh, a different style seal. So hence you could also see why uh, they would name the seal cutter. Uh, so that's 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 one example. Um, it's an interesting. Uh, obviously, this uh, this particular exhortation emphasizes the shared responsibility of uh, <clears throat> the couple, both having responsibility uh, to carry out the family planning, which of course uh, stands in stark contrast to what both uh, Sarah and uh, Kailing have said about this predominantly being a female responsibility and that's also something and, and certainly the female body being the site of the various measures uh, that, are in, that, that are put in place in order to curb um, reproduction as we will see in the next set of posters as well and uh, and here again just uh, you know just another uh, an, another different style calligraphy different type of seal here focusing on um, uh, on, on, on the female and uh, female's uh, female body uh, and, and female health. 
Now, uh, the next one I find the most interesting uh, for, for, for many reasons. They're very peculiar images. There's six of them in total. I call them birth control collages. Uh, each of them introduced one particular method of birth control. Um, there is no information on the publisher or creator and they're not dated. Um, and they are appealing they're very, very interesting medley um, of things appealing to the emotions as much as they are providing hard facts uh, and guidelines and, uh, and, and this sort of mix and match of the, of, of, of the emotive and the scientific really leads to an, 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 a very interesting and eclectic assembly of imagery. Incidentally, um, I just, uh, I was also reminded, I found it really interesting to hear from Sarah uh, before that, you know, basically a hundred years ago during the Republic, um, abortion was basically uh, the most common uh, way to curb uh, reproduction, even though uh, some forms of contraception were available and advertised. And that coupled also with the, you know, with the fact that one, uh, in the People's Republic, more birth control became available and was and was promoted. That that was very much for married couples and this assumption that it's only married couples that engage in sex and reproduction, and hence they are the ones who need the information. Because it's reminded me, and this is you know we're going going here into the 1980s, um, and uh, just reading recently about uh, the, the fact that it was married couples meant also that unmarried couples having premarital sex. For them very much even in the 1980s abortion was still the main uh, way of, um, of, of of avoiding uh, the, you know uh, avoiding a, a child and avoiding reproduction and um, reading the June 4th book by Jeremy Brown reminded that Tyling at the age of 24 had already had three abortions um, so it's uh, this sort of university students in the 1980s and sexually active young people you know that 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 was the one method that was available to them so here we have uh, at about probably in the 1980s, we have these posters that advocate and introduce a number of different, well, in, in total, six different forms of contraception. Uh, and they sort of these images are really quite interesting because, you, you know, they introduced the, uh, the form of uh, contraception um, with a sort of image uh, sort of faintly romantic uh, image, mostly showing just one person. I, I think there's one of the six that shows a couple. Um, we have, um, there, is a, there is a poem, it might be too small on your screens, but there is each, each poster has, has a poem um, focusing on, you know, sort of rosy futures, happy life, self-fulfillment. Um, with a with a with a slogan in sort of cursive script running across it, and then coupled with sort of hard scientific diagrams and instructions on how to use this particular method, how to avail yourself of it, but also what kind of side effects there could be and and what things would would need to be um, observed uh, before before choosing this particular method. Um, it also um, indicates whether a um, whether a method is uh, available, you know, for, for, for men or women, and in, in this particular case, sterilization uh, is it, for men or, or women. But of the, of the six posters, the majority focus on methods for, for women. So here we've got, so that's, that's just another one similar example. You can see, you can see that, you know, the design principles here, uh, you know, about the uh, in the in the previous poster, you didn't have a product because it's, it's sterilization. There's no there's no product to buy that you can showcase. But here, you actually have um, uh, the uh, you know the product what it looks like. So this is a uh, this is a this is a pill, but not a pill that you take orally, but a but but a pill that you insert uh, in in the vagina. Uh, and uh, so you have each of the posters has an image of what the product looks like when you buy it in the shop or when you get it. Uh, and then again, you've got the poem, you've got this sort of faintly romantic image, and then you've got the hard facts. Uh, and it, it tells you that it's, you, well, it's why young is used externally, ex which is interesting, uh, seeing that it uh, needs to be inserted into the vagina. I'm not sure what's why young about that. Uh, and then um, an another one, uh, which is sort of faintly Marilyn Monroe-like 
uh, image and, and 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 the poem and the and and the, and the product uh, and and the hard scientific fact. I can see that there is a question in the chat. I just don't know what it is for me. So um, I don't want to. I can't really go into the chat without disrupting my presentation mode. So if somebody can just uh, if if there is a question I should address now, then somebody let me know. Now. Um, what is interesting about these posters, though, I would say, I mean, there's a lot about them, which I find interesting, but in all the, in the poetry and in all the slogans, there isn't actually a reference to the wider project of population control or suture or any of that. In fact, there is a lot of emphasis on personal happiness, happiness and happy families uh, are referenced a lot, but also in particular in the case of uh, the sterilization, it emphasizes, you know, all the opportunities, all the things that you can do, all how, how it frees you up to do other things uh, in life. So that's an interesting absence here in these posters of the reference to the discourse, the wider state discourse. Then uh, I just have, uh, and I'm nearly, I'm, I'm nearly done, there's some posters which are called regional wall newspapers. There's some posters from uh, Chengdu uh, and so there's four of them, it's a series of four and it actually, they are numbered uh, again. The, these are really, uh, you know, they're different, completely different again. They're very, very rich in text. They are, you know, there really is a lot to read on them. Uh, there's a little bit of sort of uh, more um, folklore, uh, ethnic uh, imagery on them again from a design perspective, from the graphic design perspective, I find them quite interesting. So that is one of the four pages that each each of the each of these uh, newspaper sheets effectively actually contains a number of different mini small articles, and um, uh, you know here uh, you 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 can see you know practical practical questions answered on one of the on one of the other posters. It also talks about how you know the the, the dad of the future doesn't smoke, for example. So I found it was really interesting, at least something targeted directly at, at men. And interesting to me, for those of you who know, you know what me, well, that there is a lot, again, there's a lot of reference here to Xinfu, uh, sort of, you know, uh, as, a, as a layer behind, you know, it's birth control, association between birth control, uh, family planning and Xinfu happiness. Uh, and also, as I said, some interesting designs, uh, which, you know, for those who study design and the de evolution of design or different styles, these posters, quite apart from their content, uh, can be an in a really interesting resource. They might be able to link to other things uh, that they're doing. Uh, again, this is also a detail of one of the four uh, posters, uh, these newspaper style posters. And this is precisely about um, promoting premarital checks. So again, something that uh, Sarah mentioned before, uh, the, um, I think it was Sarah rather than Kailing, uh, that uh, young pe people about to get married started to be encouraged to have a premarital um, health checks. So that's also one of the topics on, on, on one of those posters. And that is it, it would seem. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing now. Uh, that's that's also, so that that's my sort of uh, that's my contribution for today. Uh, just a, an introduction. I haven't um, I haven't introduced all of them, but these are the maybe about two thirds of the posters that um, are not quite not quite not quite. There's a whole scroll of comics, for example, that I haven't had a chance to look at. Amazing, thank you, Gerda. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't wait. I mean, I'm always fascinated by the posters, but the colors really, um, you know, as you pointed out, the colors really stand out to me in some of those posters, and the graphics are always fantastic. But the discourses of happiness and kind of uh, the, the the lack of reference to state kind of discourses is really, or I guess state state policy, for example, is quite that's quite striking in those ones. Um, I think one of the things that really interested me too, and this, you know, back Kyling uh, to, to your paper and Sarah to yours as well, is, um, and I'll just uh, pin you all to, it sounds so aggressive, but I'll just make sure that everyone's uh, here on the, on the main screen. Something that um, 
strikes me as well, here we go, sorry, I'm just looking for Tara, was the, um, you know, who's the target of these, you know, the various slogans, the posters, the images, who's included and who's not, because we, we talk so much about, um, you know, across all of your, your papers, we were talking about, you know, kind of uneven access, for example, and the inconsistencies in terms of how policy is, is implemented um, at various, you know, different historical junctures as well. Um, and I was really struck, I think, Kylie, you know, in particular, you were talking about the modernization project and the kind of, you know, nation building and the place of reproduction, the place of reproductive politics, poli the place of reproductive politics within that modernizing project um, and how it becomes a, a project of governance then as well. And so, you know, I guess I was, I was thinking was that, you know, a form of governance as well is not just those who come under the umbrella, like those who are targeted by these policies, but also those who are excluded from the policies in, in, in one way or another. Um, so, you know, groups I, were, I was thinking about um, were, for example, single women, where they fit within this. And I guess this is, you know, this is single women, this is queer couples as well, and, and perhaps even get into questions of surrogacy as well, and, and the, the right to give birth, the right to parent and so on. So I was wondering, uh, Kylie and Sarah, if you could say a little bit about those forms of exclusion as a kind of kind of governance as well, a kind of uh, population governance. You want to go first, Kelly, or I can go? Oh. Please go first and I will follow. Thank you. OK, I, I can speak more to, to, to the past, obviously, as a historian. Um, I would say that this this trend of exclusion um, and targeted slogans is something that goes way back even before perhaps the, the People's Republic of China. Um, the, the type of imagery and advertising and all sorts of different uh, media almost exclusively target the heterosexual family, the nuclear family is, is, is the goal and the object of all of these um, kind of state projects. And there's just a complete uh, exclusion of, of non-married people, of, of single mothers. Um, there's really no reference to a non-heteronormative family at all. And surrogates would have been just completely outside of what is the norm. Yeah, should I, should I start? Yeah, um, I think that just remind me, thank you very much for your question. I just thought um, I did not have time to go into one of the chapter in my book, which was basically talking about premarital abortion and then understand why people choose to, or basically um, almost unanimously among my participants um, who were presented with a vignette saying that if a young couple, um, they were dating and then um, accidentally the girl got pregnant and then a marriage is not really on the table, what would people suggest them to do? So from both men and women I interviewed and everybody said, oh gosh, if marriage is not possible, totally get abortion. And they give me all sorts of reasons, different layers of reasons why that is the case, which I think relate to the question you just asked, like who is in excluded is this idea of, again, it's like heteronormative family is the only legitimate side to, repro uh, to reproduction, and therefore um, single parenthood, single motherhood is just like understood, even for those who have resources, financial resources to pay. And like a lot of uh, women I interview said, nowadays it's not really a matter of whether I can afford it because both my parents and I, we have like a lot of money to actually raise up the child with enough uh, education resources, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also this kind of societal expectation on healthy environment to bring up a child. And therefore I'm really worried 
say that if I do choose to have a child on my own, it's not only like not responsible for myself because it might jeopardize my future marriage prospect to find a suitable partner in the future, but also I, I feel I'm not being responsible for this unborn child if I give birth to this child into a, this kind of weird abnormal context. So I think that does highlight that this kind of regime is not only say, um, who can or cannot have access to abortion, but it's like shaping the norm and understanding of, uh, of family and childbirth, what is normal and abnormal, really regulate, become this kind of invisible force to shape people's choices and preferences in many ways. So I think that's a, a form of exclusion and, and which basically in, in some way will uh, wipe out this kind of will for individual to even so-called choose, if even if they have the material mean to choose um, single parenthood. But that being said, it does not mean there are uh, no, nobody, actually there are plenty individuals, um, men, women, female, male, and uh, queer, um, people who choose to have to uh, have child children on their own and with their own means. So I, I think we also need to see that the agency of the individuals, but again, um, with this kind of population controls comes hand in hand as I presented in my presentation. It is part of this kind of modernization project. Modernization project since the 90, uh, end of 1970s, beginning of 1980s is come, well, again, comes deli were delivered through marketization. Yeah. So there's also this kind of unruling market forces that privatization brought in this kind of private investment and we have a huge um, sort of increase of private clinics and hospitals that provide all sorts of different services. Yeah. Um, therefore it does offers options if you, for those who are able to pay. So in some way, it does offer this kind of individual choices for certain people, but again, this kind of options also exclude, especially for those who are disprivileged. And, and, and I think that is something, um, again, another important under the research, I would say, um, phenomenon is those marginalized population, for example, uh, rural women who can't really um, get access to this kind of services. And what would they do um, in, term, in facing this kind of unplanned pregnancy? worth more attention to, yeah. Yeah, brilliant, thank you, Kailing. Thank you, Sarah, I think, um, yeah, really, really important observations. I mean, it, it just keeps coming back to class, doesn't it? It keeps coming back to the intersection of, of class and gender in terms of, you know, who is uh, a target, for example, and who has access to all of the different, um, well, who has a choice, right? Who, who, can, who can have meaningful agency um, at different historical points. Um, we've got a few questions and comments coming in now in the chat, so I'll, I'll stop hogging um, <laughs> the question question space. Um, so I would just, yeah, to encourage everyone that if you've got a question, just drop it into the chat. You can send it directly to me and I'll, um, I'll try to follow along and not get too um, bombarded <laughs> by all of the questions as, uh, as can quickly happen. So the first point, uh, and this is... Um, yeah, this is a question I, I had myself as well. Is, is is someone would like to know more about the um, the kind of uh, feminist activism uh, that has come up in relation to the kind of politics of reproduction historically and in in the contemporary era as well? Um, so, who, what kind of feminist activism has happened in response to some of these discourses and practices, and who are the feminist actors who are doing that kind of work. I think I might be able to say a little bit uh, in response to that, because um, I do had included one slide about feminist activism. And I think, um, first of all, I think we need to also bear in mind in the 1990s, China, apart from what we discussed about the reproduction, uh, reproductive policies and this kind of thing, China also had this kind of um, rolling out of mass, uh, well, increasing access to higher education, yeah. So um, at the end of 1990s, beginning of 2000, there was also this kind of push to make sure we have more university spaces for individuals. And I think that really opened up uh, for, especially for the so-called privileged urban uh, residents um, to send their children to, um, to universities. That somehow really significantly increased the amount of people 
um, in China who are able to access university education. In terms of quality, and that is a different question, but that does increase the education level. And I think um, because of this kind of the multiple uh, policy shifts at happening at the same time, it does in many ways uh, shape um, uh, or produce, I would say, this kind of cohort of well-educated young generations. And especially if we look at the gender ratios, I don't have the uh, statistic at hand, but we do see this kind of rising number of female uh, students in higher education. And I think that uh, that cohort really forms not only them, but they form a large proportion of this kind of burgeoning young feminist activists in China. And because their education will allow them to have the knowledge as well as the resources to self-mobilize and organize and organizing discussion groups as well as forums online and offline. So um, from what I've observed, I think this is the trend that is not necessarily, um, I think it's a byproduct of China's modernization pro state project. And then in, even though maybe uh, certain discussion is not welcomed uh, by the state, but certainly um, it's not easily can be erased. And if you want to erase this kind of social movement, you basically need to go against this kind of longstanding belief in education in Chinese society, which I don't think that will happen in any time soon on any level. So therefore it's really hard to really completely cracked down because it has happened. Education is something once you have taught somebody to uh, to read, you can't really unteach them to read. So um, I would say I see it as unstoppable forces. But as I said, I don't think it's only well-educated women are participating. There are also other, uh, for example, uh, women who works in factories, they are also very active in organizing to defend their rights as well. And some of you might have um, come across the one of the documentary, which I personally love is Hooligan Sparrow. Yeah. So and which is basically this was previous procedure. She she basically organized her own activism and um, collaborated with other uh, civil rights activists in China um, to push um, push societal changes. And I think that is also worth uh, mentioning. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, uh, and Sarah, what about thinking historically? Um, you know, I was kind of thinking. Um, uh, I can't remember where she's based, the scholar Wang Zheng, who's written a lot about kind of history, uh, you know, histories of state feminism, for example, but perhaps, you know, in the time period you're looking at, even, be, you know, before 1949 as well, what, how have feminist actors tried to inform or resist the kind of different uh, state discourses and, and policies, practices, and so on? So, if we're going to the 1950s, although I think feminist concerns have, as Wang Zheng has shown, have always been fairly marginal um, in the grand scheme of policymaking, um, feminist actors were actually uh, part of the reason why there was this real initial relaxation uh, on access to abortion and birth control. In fact, um, feminist leaders and and just members of the educated public actually wrote to government leaders saying, we demand birth control and abortion because we can't be having, we can't hold up our half of the sky because we, we, we don't have time. We can't work and have consecutive births all the time. Um, so I think there was a sort of institutional aspect to that. Um, but equally important, I would say is the role that, I would say more, I don't know if they're more marginal, but kind of more ordinary or less visible women play um, in, in pushing back against state authority. I think, at least from my own research, I've seen, although it, it, up through the 1980s, China had a very high marriage rate and almost every marriage would lead to offspring. Um, speaking kind of to what Kyling was addressed addressing, but in a more historical context, there have always been women who have been resisting the state construction of, of um, reproduction by, by secretly having abortions, by secretly using birth control. Um, and I found that, that, that women have been doing this for a long time to not basically denying their bodies to the state by, um, by arbitrarily aborting a pregnancy. And again, this go goes back to the kind of class dimension. Only those who had the kind of perceived class 
status, um, who were in a kind of a superior position, uh, were able to to access abortions and things like that. But I would say that um, not reproducing as is as strong of a, a form of feminist protest as is any other type of you know online activism. Alternative, it was kind of like an alternative form of uh, resistance, I guess. It's not often considered, but yeah, that, that's a really good example. Um, yeah, really, yeah, it's really, I, I feel like I'm learning a lot. I hope, <laughs> I hope other audience, hope audience members are also learning a lot from today's discussion. I wanted to um, pick up on a few more questions, but before I do, just to remind everyone that you can you can send your questions uh, directly to me. So you can basically uh, you can see in the chat box there is you can see two, and you can scroll down to Shakeo and send it right there, and I'll I'll, I'll pick it up. Um, so there's another question here um, from uh, Professor Sarah Donsey at Nottingham, uh, who has asked a question about this disability for for uh, both Sarah and Kyling. Um, so. Sarah has asked, to what extent does disability figure in the histories and stories of reproduction and desirability that you have studied? So how does, how do these questions of, of disability and uh, yeah, how does it feature in these stories of, of reproduction and the kind of desirability um, ideals around reproduction as well? Should I quickly I'll go first because I think uh, maybe Sarah has more answers um, than this one. And <laughs> um, I have to say, um, thank you very much for this question. I think I was reading um, Professor Sarah, well, Duncan's book as well on disability. And I was like, well, you are actually an expert on this. Uh, what should I say? But in my book, I do see this kind of complete invisibility um, about disability. And when it comes to uh, when I was presenting my then year to my participants about, for example, if your child, what is your most worrying sort of um, factors when it comes to pregnancy? A lot of them mention, oh, I the worst nightmare would be if my child is disabled and then oh, I have any sort of um, problems that I can't be detected early enough in order for me to choose to have abortion. Yeah, so the fear and anxiety related to having a disabled child is very much internalized by the population. And which I think is under, understandably so, because if you think about how much uh, there is in terms of supportive system in China, in Chinese uh, societies, to support families and individuals to raise up cho children needs uh, an extra support is very much minimum. So I think no wonder why the individual, might, especially my participants, will be so willingly to uh, shy away from this and they'll choose to abort their so-called well disabled uh, fetuses and this kind of thing. So I think this kind of invis uh, invisibility and almost silence or rejection of disabled body among uh, my participants does say a lot about the marginalization um, on this topic and especially for those families and individual children. Yeah. Yeah, my um, uh, kind of findings align very much with what Kylie just mentioned. I will say though, um, disability and not in the, the way that we talk about it now, of course, but in this kind of uh, patho pathologized way of talking about diseased bodies, otherized bodies, is very extremely prominent um, in the Republican era, in not just in China, but all over the world. It's part of a global discussion about what it means to be a modern citizen. What does a healthy body look like? What does a, a governable uh, population look like. Um, and so there's almost this kind of creepy obsession with correct and incorrect bodies in the 20s and 30s um, and a little bit into the 40s because people are still thinking about it in the context of war and the like. Then going into the 1950s, um, there's a, a not noticeable absence of any discussion of, of, of bodies that are different. Um, in fact, the, the kind of state discourse seems to be the more the merrier, whatever you look like, it, it's great if you're healthy, but we just want you to exist because your mere existence is strengthening the, the nation. Um, <laughs> that, that discourse quickly goes away moving into the, the mid 1950s when there's increasingly this discussion of why 
are our children so unhealthy or perceived to be so unhealthy in China? Why um, are mothers so sickly? Is a, is a sickly mother going to produce a sickly child, et cetera? Um, but the, the conversation doesn't really go beyond that until we enter basically the late 1970s, early 1980s. And then all like basically verbatim the conversations that were going on in the 20s and 30s come back. The same imagery, the same uh, notion uh, of, of individual health being uh, kind of a microcosm of national health. Um, and so suddenly there's this, this quite creepy obsession with monitoring pregnancies from, from basically from the mother and father's earliest stages to the baby's earliest stages, constantly testing, making sure that the parents are of good quality uh, and things like that, preventing them from marrying or, or having children as, as soon as possible. Um, and I would argue that it's, it's really this kind of state-led obsession with just determining what's a norm, normal body versus an abnormal body that's made people today so, so preoccupied with defining normativity. If the state didn't lead with that, I think people wouldn't, it wouldn't be so marginal, so marginalized or so taboo as it is um, because of all of these posters and in, 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 in clinics, like you go to, a woman would go to get her first um, uh, prenatal checkup when she's already pregnant, but that, to make sure everything's going okay. And there's signs littered around the the clinic that say, if your kid, your baby or fetus has has these characteristics, you need to abort. This is this is going to um, weaken the nation. It's going to waste your money. It's going to destroy your family. Um, it's very straightforward. Gosh, that, yeah, it's, it's it's really striking. I think you know we've talked, um, I think, quite a bit so far about the ideals surrounding the family and the place of the family within the state. But I think when, I think particularly when we think about disability, the ideals surrounding the national body as well, like it does become very, very individual too. And, and I think, um, I guess that can kind of get lost actually and like become very, very focused on, on, um, on, on just family. Um, yeah, fantastic, really, really, um, can I just add on to that? Because I, I yeah, just remind me um, something I'm recently working on is like, um, well, especially under the current President Xi Jinping, there was this kind of heightened uh, promotion of a realizing Chinese dream, which is very much closely tied to this kind of national humiliation discourse. So I think when we talk about national body and, and reproduction, reproductive health is very much rooted in this kind of understanding of China as a humiliated nation, as a like Dong Ya Bing Fu. I don't know the exact uh, um, English translation. Anybody can help me, please. Um, it's basically we're perceiving China as a sickening man in uh, in Asia. And how can you transform this kind of sickened, failing national body? into some, but something that is strong and powerful and to go back to this kind of perceived imagined central stage in, in, um, in, in the world. So I think, um, I think that really um, highlights the close link between not only under the current, uh, current, current um, presidency, but also goes back to the nationalist government, I think Sarah presented. Is there, there is this kind of long lasting history and discourses circulated uh, that is in, in influencing the current policy and as well as the discourse. We see a lot of similarities um, in terms of eugenic discourses circulated at the beginning of the 20th century uh, versus those who have been, again, become repopularized in under marketization as well. Yeah, which is very much same, the same kind of uh, logic is uh, individual body, reproductive body, national body and national strengthening, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, also intertwined and interlinked and informing each other and, and so on. Fantastic. Um, so I have another question. Uh, so this one is from Faye, one of our um, uh, PhD students. And, and this kind of follows on from the question I was you know, thinking about exclusion and different, the unevenness, right, of how um, these policies are actually implemented. So. Uh, Faye is wondering if there are class differences when it comes to social impressions towards single men and single women. So, for example, single men are called bare branches, 
but some of them are also called golden bachelors, right? Um, which does not necessarily sound like a bad thing, maybe, right? So that's a question for you, to, for you both. Um, and what about impressions towards left over women in relation to class in today's China as well? So could you both say something about that, the kind of class dimensions when it comes to ideas about the single man, the single woman, and so on? I suspect Kylie has more to say on this. <laughs> Should I start and maybe Sarah can add? Um, I think Huang Jin Dan Shen Han is hard to come by. Yeah, it's like you basically, if you look at this kind of marriage, if you see the marriage dating site as a market, and we're talking about uh, the the tiny cohort of men occupy the top of the pyramid, and who basically were gen uh, well generally perceived as financially accomplished and then um, um, from very privileged background and are able to embody this kind of desiring um, cosmopolitan masculinity, and then um, obviously should be very popular in the marriage market. So um, yes, so they are definitely not part of this kind of perceived uh, failing bare branches that is uh, very much hidden um, in, in many ways perceived as a threat to the public st stability, uh, social stability. But this, uh, this particular sort of label, Dan Shen, uh, Huang Jing Dan Shen Han, um, so in some way, in my view, highlights the difficulties that the current Chinese young people face in, their, in terms of their dating practice as well as their marriage expectations. Because I think there is definitely this kind of strong um, class expectations still very much remain on po possibly heightened under marketization is this kind of necessity to secure your class position. And because of this kind of post socialist shift away from um, social welfare and stability, uh, so securities, and the individual were thrown into basically um, left on their own devices to fund themselves and their family. So family become in weird way, become uh, under marketization becomes a so-called safe haven for uh, for individual to uh, draw from support and uh, resources for their own well-being. So, how can you secure yourself through this kind of family formation through marriage? Obviously, the most uh, rational choice is to make sure your partner could match equal value, if not adding value to yourself. So. We, what we see in this kind of Huang Jin Dan Shen Han Ye Hao or, the, uh, or this kind of uh, leftover women, which is very much in the same way labeled pressurized women to hurry up, don't be, become leftover. Yeah. But the real problem is the, the social reality really um, prohibit individual to, uh, especially individual women, to marry down. Yeah, if you think about under marketization and also the kind of resurgent traditional understanding of heteronormative uh, uh, marriage that women need to marry up, not only for their own sort of uh, financial security, but also for the social status that is attached to a middle class success. So uh, on multiple levels that prohibit um, the, this kind of matchmaking choices for women who are privileged, because obviously you are higher up in a, a social ladder, the less options you have. And we all know that the pyramid, uh, the higher up you go, the small portion you, you can choose from. Yeah. So the Huang Jin Dan Shen Han, yes, that's what we see that in the marriage market, women uh, who are more privileged has less options, um, conventional options, unless they are willing to compromise. But if they do choose to compromise, there are also other difficulties they will encounter, but socially as well as financially, practically. So that's something. And also in terms of this kind of dating practice, or even in the second, sorry, after divorce, people would say, for example, after, after the first divorce and the marriage failed, once a divorced man were very, according to my participant, were perceived as more mature, therefore they understand the difficulties of marriage. So they have uh, they somehow become also popular choices even for younger women whereas a divorced woman were considered as in many ways offensive term and um, devalued properties yeah it's like you are buying somebody my part one of my participants used the metaphor say you are as if you're buying a sort of secondhand house that's far from ideal we all know like how obsessed um china 
in, in terms of the population about the new buying new uh, apartment. Yeah, you obviously buy a new apartment. Unlike in the UK, you, everybody's buying second well, hand houses. Everybody's expecting to have a brand new apartment. And in the, same, in the same way, if we apply this metaphor, you can see the difficulties that the gender dynamic we face um, and behind this kind of label of Huang Jin Dan Sheng Han. Yeah, and I think that highlights the privilege, the still remaining male privileges especially the upper uh, layer you go, the more obvious it becomes. Well, it's fascinating. Um, it reminds me also, uh, there's a, I guess it's not the same as class, but kind of intertwined with class is education level. Um, I, in, in trying to do my own research, I, I kept stumbling uh, in trying to do, conduct interviews and stumbling into the, the fact that the people I was interviewing kept reminding me that I was, you know, you're so old, you need to hurry up. And they would say, but I can help you out. You have this PhD, we can overlook that because um, it's not very attractive. But my son has a PhD and his is, a, his is much sexier than yours. And um, we, we could match you two up. So, so it's interesting that education from when it's a man is it, perceived as something sexy. It's got kind of cultural, social capital. Whereas um, on a woman, it's it's something almost shameful. But yeah, that's all I have to add. No, I think, I mean, it, it just, um, oh, it, it really, you know, it reminds me again about these very particular social ideals and very particular way that different people, different groups of people are coded, right? And it really kind of comes back to, um, uh, yeah, desirability, right? This question of, of, of desirability, who's desirability and who's compatible too, right? So it's, it, it feels, you know, it feels like it's all, the game is rigged, right? Like the, the rules have been set, the rules have been established and like you follow them, breaking them is too difficult. Um, and of course, China's no uh, exception in that regard. I've got so there's, uh, of another question in the chat, um, uh, an important question that I want to ask both of you as well. Um, so, so, so I'm wondering, have your studies encountered families uh, where you know children were born outside uh, the one child policy, for example? So maybe they were the second or the third. Um, or who were abandoned by their families um, because of because of the policy because of the restrictions, has that been something um, that has come up in your research in some way, or even have you have you come across some, like even official discourses or um, counter discourses in some way that that deal with um, the the realities uh, for those who uh, you know fall outside of the one child policy in in one way or another. Sarah, should I, do you want to go? No, you can go first if you'd like. Okay, I just have uh, some quick answer for this. And I think, well, for in, in terms of my book, I deliberately selected those uh, who are from this kind of one child uh, generation. Most of them, I would say 99% of my participants are from the one child family. So they were the only child. Mm -hmm. But I do have one participant and also some of them told me their experience of uh, their peers who are who had siblings. One of them, which I find it's interesting, might, that might highlight the caveats under the policy, people still be able to negotiate um, in some way successfully to have uh, more than one child. One of them is uh, her parents actually worked in Tibet as cadres. So I think there were different policies in, uh, uh, targeted at different sort of population. Obviously, if you're if you not, I think during the uh, one child policy, for those who are not Han, ethnically Han Chinese, and they were allowed to have more than one child. And that was basically uh, the case. So um, for this particular girl, um, she her parents were worked in Tibet. I don't think her parents were actually uh, Tibetan or any of them, but they were able to somehow access the, privilege, the policy sort of um, gap in between because they were working there, therefore they were allowed, they have special treatment. So this kind of thing do, does exist, but I think this case is particularly highlight the privilege as well. Um, and I think there are also um, a lot of cases that um, 
people who, for example, uh, I remember in the 1990s when I was a child, there was this famous uh, sort of uh, stage theater performance in the in CCTV's New Year Gala, which was called like Chaoshen Yuji Dui. I don't know how to translate that. It's basically like a gorilla, uh, gorilla fam families like running around like gorillas, uh, hiding away from the, uh, the, uh, the population control sort of cadres trying to uh, catch them. And then that destroys their houses. So the whole family has to uh, carry all their babies and running around different villages and hiding in different places and this kind of thing. So, um, so I think that uh, that that obviously that was put on uh, the national stage at a time that was hugely popular. And I think um, scholars has argued that particular on um, this kind of genre of performance and um, show the tensions as well as negotiation between the state powers versus this kind of uh, populations, Chinese population trying to basically presenting the real problems people face under the policy and hoping to highlight that uh, the necessity to change in, in some ways, yes. In my own research, um, it, I think I, I was sort of in some ways working with a similar population to Kailing. Um, I mostly found, I, I actually, I did find quite plenty of people who had had multiple children, but not because they were, had violated the policy, but because they were part of the sort of 1.5 category. So they just waited several years. Sometimes they didn't even necessarily want to have the second child, but it just sort of happened. And then they're like, oh, okay, we have a second child. Um, so I met quite a few people who had had uh, a second child or in some cases, even a, a third, but they hadn't actually violated any policy. I met a few people who had openly violated the one child policy and um, they just paid some fines. Um, at, at that particular, like in, in conducting that research, I had expected to find, and it may be a product of who I was talking to or my own positionality, I was expecting to find more people who had been forced to abort pregnancies or things like that. And I actually did not find that um, uh, due to a variety of factors. So um, it, it, my own research, suggested a, a larger level of urban compliance than I had um, necessarily been prepared for. And the rhetoric seems surrounding that seems to be, oh, all of the violations take place in the countryside. Here in urban areas, we have self-control, we follow the policy, um, whatever that entails. Um, can I just add on that? I think that's a very important point because um, a lot of people were well, myself included, at the beginning of my research, I was very much misled by the, the term of one child policy. And then the, a lot of this kind of media sensation around this policy as if there was like watertight uh, implementation, which is certainly not true. And we also see that, like, yes, at the initial stage, when it's a little bit like, well, I shouldn't make this comparison, probably not appropriate about COVID policy, but well, let's leave that aside. Let's look at the 1980s uh, when one child policy were first rolled out. Um, you do see this kind of, this kind of militant operation and make sure the cadres were put under pressure to hit the target in order to make sure they can't really, otherwise they lose their job, obviously, then they, they somehow will choose whatever means within their power to make sure there is no extra birth. But as we move to uh, towards end of 1990s, at the beginning of 2000, I think China also witnessed this kind of shifting of governance strategies, and which is basically, as Sarah already mentioned, that a lot of focus were put on, well, fining people, issuing fines. So if you uh, violated the, the birth con uh, control policies, and then you, you, ne you need to pay fine. Yeah. So that also opened windows for uh, families and individuals who are able to afford the fine they basically were allowed to have as many children as they want. And obviously for family with means, they could also negotiate um, with local uh, cadres and there are different kinds of ways that you can get, get away from it. And for example, there were a lot of celebrities in China would have children outside of China, even though they themselves hold the Chinese passport and this kind of thing does happen a lot. So that again, highlights the privileges under the, car, uh, under the policy itself. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Kailing. Um, so I know Gerda wanted to come in on this one as well. Gerda, did you want to add to that? Yes, just briefly, I'm also very conscious of time, which is probably <clears throat> start wrapping up. But I, um, in my research on Christianity and Christians and my, my I've encountered, of course, many 
Christians who had more uh, Christian families uh, who had more than one child. So it's it's, it's also a, you know question of deep you know faith and conviction. Be that you know you know for all sorts of reasons. Partly, of course, also very conservative reasons and and not not uh, using birth control. So um, that's also a factor, and and I guess it confirms that. Yes, there were lots of exceptions, but again, of course, it's a question also of means. Uh, so you know, they would have to you know be able to pay the fines and and the private schooling and so forth. I just wanted to again, we have sort of this sort of <laughs> this chasm between the urban and the rural, and the educated and the uneducated. And I think we also get a lot of of we got a lot of the narratives about this sort of um, merciless uh, enforcement of the one child policy in in rural areas and. You know, Chen Guangcheng, of course, uh, and his work as a lawyer is, 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 is very is, is famous there. I think we should also spare thought, though, for rural cadres who are, of course, not rural cadres and, and um, ex expected to enforce the policy and who are imposed from outside because the rural cadres are very much part of the local rural community. Uh, and they will have other ties. They will be tied into this community, both emotionally and, and, and with their families. And I think possibly you know these sort of narratives that we hear a lot about the enforced and brutal enforcement of uh, of, of the one child policy which i'm not saying does not take place but i think probably possibly in 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 more cases it's a case of turning turning you know a blind eye or sort of tacitly sort of tolerating uh, practices like going to a different village to give birth uh, you know to 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 a, to a second child or a third child i mean of course this all has and a lot of ramifications because the child, of course, the birth isn't registered. Um, a lot of the time, these will be female children whose birth is therefore not registered and so forth. But I do feel sometimes we also need to maybe, you know, un understand that the local enforcer, you need the rural local enforcer is possibly more embedded in the community in which he has to enforce, or he, well, he or she have to enforce the rules uh, than, uh, than, in, than in the urban context. Can I just add on that? Because, Gerda, you just remind me this wonderful example I have um, in terms of like a rural uh, population when under the one child policy, the problem was, um, well, like I totally agree with Gerda because like the cadres were also part of the community. So a lot of the time, apart from the hor horrible story we will hear about how they enforce the policy, but um, in many cases, they also help the families and especially the women device find ways to actually make it work for them. So I have a friend who um, basically she she's blind. So she has a sister, they were born be before the one child policy and she's blind and she's considered as disabled and she never married, but her because her sister wanted to have more than one child. So the family were able to negotiate in some way that to register the second child under her name. Yeah, and then pay her compensation in that way. And the local carters were somehow involved in the process of facilitated this. So there are different ways people do have agencies to negotiate. And then I think the rural population, um, we should, yeah, we should totally avoid this kind of one-sided story about rural cadres and how uh, ruthless they were um, at that time. In terms of rural urban divide, I also want to say that people often see, oh, the unruly rural population, they just don't know what is a good, um, good practice for childbirth. And I think that's totally not true. And then I think that's why it's important for us to highlight that the, the differences in terms of uh, production models in Chinese society, in terms of rural and uh, urban division, that really give uh, rise to the necessity of more children in, in certain contexts. So when we try to, when, when the media, uh, media attention paid on the rural population say they just want to have more children as if they are uneducated, un uncivil, I think that's just so unfair because you totally neglect, neglect the economic necessity for certain communities and the under sort of under development or under investment in these communities that drive certain uh, reproductive behaviors yeah brilliant thank you um thank you all it was a really i think we'll have to wrap it up there <laughs> we're at three o'clock now we're at one minute past three my terrible timekeeping skills um so i think we'll wrap it up there for today um it's been a really fantastic uh, and very rich um, um, discussion today. I feel like I've learned a lot. So massive thank you to our brilliant uh, panelists. A big thank you to you, Sarah, to Kyling and Gerda for sharing this, you know, introducing this fantastic new collection of posters as well. So big thank you to all of you. And 
And a big thank you to all of you who come and joined us today for the discussion as well. Lots of really fantastic questions and comments. Um, I couldn't quite get through all of them, but I hope I, I did uh, a reasonable amount of justice to the wide range of questions that you asked. Um, so I guess that's it for today. The, 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 the final thing that I'll say is that I, you know, I mentioned a fourth a mysterious fourth event in uh, the conference deconstructed series for this year. So I'm just going to drop that into the chat, uh, connecting Chinese digital and analog spaces. So that takes place on May 4th, and that's the final event in our deconstructed conference deconstructed series for this year. Um, so please register for that and, and, and come along. This event will be has been recorded and uh, will be available on YouTube um, in the not too distant future. So watch out uh, our watch our Twitter timeline for updates on when that becomes available. Um, and thank you so much once again to everyone. And I hope to see you at our next event. So have a nice day wherever you are and see you next time. <laughs>